My name is Patrick King. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about my journey um, from being a Postgres DBA for many years to transitioning to MySQL. Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mustache if you want to ask questions or you just want to yell at me for being bad. Um, I work at Yelp. Yelp's mission is for uh, connecting people with great local businesses around them. It's a really inspiring company to work for. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, my database experience, I started, as I said, seven years ago as a, as a Postgres DBA on Postgres 8.4, which was released in 2009, and uh, it was a 50 terabyte OLAP database. Um, I started working on MySQL 11 months, 22 days, and two hours ago. Um, it was my first time ever using another database in a professional setting. Um, so what I am going to cover today, topics that I found interesting transitioning between the two databases are replication, schema changes, uh, query plans, and uh, indexing types. Um, and a little bit about what this talk isn't today. Um, uh, it's not going to be about which database product is better. It's not going to be, you know, bashing one or the other. If you really want to find that, you can head to anywhere on the internet, and I'm sure you can find somebody arguing at any time. Um, and really, it boils down to there's more that unites us than divides us. We're all database administrators trying to do a really good job um, and provide our customers with their data. Um, to give you a little background, uh, MySQL at Yelp, uh, we have a, it started in 2004 as kind of a monolithic LAMP stack where the, the P is Python. Um, recently, we've started moving features out of that monolith and data out of that monolith into a service-oriented architecture. Um, so because of that, we have hundreds of databases, schemas. Um, we do about 15 schema changes a week, which is, uh, for me, from what I found, kind of high. And at any given time, there's around 400 engineers, and at peak, uh, 100 interns, and there are four DBAs uh, supporting all of them. Um, we're on MySQL 5.6. We're using statement-based replication currently. Um, uh, we have replication trees that are up to five nodes deep. Um, uh, we have an intermediate master per data center, which I'll get to in a little bit, um, uh, mostly for us to save on bandwidth. We do uh, vertical sharding at the database level. We don't really have any hor horizontal sharding of our data yet. Um, and something that we've gotten very good at as a team is most, like almost all of our maintenance, we cannot take any site downtime. So we've gotten really good at re or online remastering our databases, which is really cool. Um, some of the surprises when I started at Yelp and first started to learn all of this. Um, we don't, there's no physical partitioning. I was sh shocked at uh, the size of some of our tables and how large they were without, you know, any, any sort of partitioning or sharding. It's not, I'm, I'm used to heavily sharded environments. Um, and the number of schema changes we do a week, I'm, I'm more used to places where you get a few a quarter as teams like ramp up, build up their features, that kind of thing. Um, uh, there are nested replication hierarchy. Uh, it wasn't until in the last few years in Postgres you could even do nested replication. You could only have masters and replicas. Um, uh, and ha looking at like our diagram of like how deep our replication trees were, were was just mind-boggling again. Um, and just uh, MySQL replication in general. I'll get into it uh, in just a bit. But like it was, it's so to me as a Postgres DBA, it was completely different from what I'm used to. Um, we also have Postgres at Yelp. We have a couple of subsidiaries that are using it pretty heavily. Um, uh, e, uh, E24 and Yelp Reservations both use it. Um, they're on Postgres 5.6 and, or 5.5 and 5.6 respectively, and both of them are pretty monolithic, very few services supporting them. Um, when we acquire these companies over time, they were both already on Postgres and using it pretty extensively and using a lot of the features that it provides. And so we didn't really, as a company, see a need to move them off of that onto a platform uh, that we knew about. We just decided to gain the knowledge uh, among our team so that we could support what we had, what they had. So first, I'm going to talk about replication. Um, uh, the way most of these sections will go, I'm going to talk about Postgres, and then MySQL, and then the differences or the challenges I faced uh, with it. So Postgres has streaming replication. Um, what that means is that it's sending the write-ahead log, which is also the recovery log, from the master to the uh, replica databases. Um, replicas are byte-for-byte -byte copies of the master database. If you, 
at any like transaction point in time were like just to diff the files on disk, they would look the exact same. There would be no difference between them. Um, the replicas are fully read only. There's really no equivalent of like being able to do something like set read only equals zero on a on a on a Postgres replica. They are completely read only, and there's nothing you can do to change that. <laughs> Hot standby feedback, I think, is one of my favorite slash least favorite, depending on the night, uh, Postgres replication features. What happens is that all the replicas talk to their master and report back the current like usage statistics of like which blocks they're touching due to selects and where they are in the replication stream. Um, this allows Postgres to like be nicer to the replicas as it's as it's trying to do like online maintenance itself against these tables. Um, and as I said before, the write ahead log is used for both replication and crash recovery. It is it is one and the same. It originally started as the crash recovery log, and then as replication was introduced into Postgres, they just decided to use something that they already had. Um, this is my experience with replication uh, for MySQL at Yelp. I know there's many options out there, but this is just what I know. Um, so we use statement-based replication, where every single insert, update, and delete delete is logged to the binary logs after it's committed. Um, the replicas then pull those changes out of the binary logs and run the exact same SQL statement. Um, there's really no communication between the replicas and the master database. The replicas are pretty independent um, from their master. Um, and this allows for some really cool architecture designs where you can have partial data or different indexes or, you know, scrub PII, all of these things. And it's been cool to see what Yelp has done with that. Um, le lessons learned. Replication has been one of the, my continuing challenges um, on learning MySQL because to me, you know, logical replication versus binary replication are just completely different. Uh, and it's like comparing apples and oranges. Um, this, this, is, this has tripped me up specifically, is that the MySQL replicas only receive the transaction after it's been committed on the master. So you have a long running update on the master that takes, you know, minutes. Then all of a sudden you get replication delay down the hierarchy as it, every single node starts to run this really long running update. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the thing that like I kind of boiled it down to, uh, having realized that um, frequent cause of uh, replication delay in MySQL are like, like I said, large inserts, updates, and deletes being run on the replicas. And in Postgres, uh, frequent causes are um, locks against tables where blocks need to be applied. So selects uh, can stop replication on the Postgres replicas. Um, yeah, this is uh, the, you can also slow down the master database in Postgres via replication. If you're like, it's trying to do like online operations where it's rewriting indexes or something, and your replica hosts are using that data or those blocks on disk, the master will stop its online operations and wait for the replicas to finish with those blocks. So you can get slowed down on the master because your replicas are using that data. Um, so next, let's talk about schema changes. We all, we all have to do them, and they're pretty different between the two database products. Um, in Postgres, most changes I have found could just be applied uh, with minimal table locking or replication concerns. Um, uh, it, the Postgres also has transactional DDL, so you can roll back and everything. This is because uh, as the database is making the changes, the on-disk blocks via wall replication are being shipped down to the replica leafs. So everything's occurring in real time as it's rewriting on the master and then on the replicas. And then when you type in commit, every, everyone's up to date at the same time. Um, there are exceptions to this. Uh, adding a column with a default value will cause the entire table to be rewritten and then exclusive lock will be taken the whole time this is happening. Um, if you change a column type, once again, the whole table has to be rewritten. Uh, or adding an index uh, takes a exclusive lock of a table. Um, there is create index concurrently. Use this instead and it will create the index in the background with no locking. This has been talked about becoming the default in Postgres. It's not happened yet, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, yeah, for MySQL, a lot of people use tools to help manage um, their uh, manage schema changes. Uh, we use Procon Online Schema Change. 
There's also uh, GitHub on online schema transmogrifier. I learned Woo! the T. <laughs> and uh, these are usually required for <laughs> Shana. These are usually quite required for uh, you know safe online operations so that you know you're not getting massive replication delay. Um, MySQL does have some online schema changes. Um, and we at Yelp do use them uh, for smaller tables, but for the most part, you know, you, you would like to use something to help manage your schema changes. Um, yeah, I, like I think I've touched on it. This is uh, true because, like, again, with replication, the alter statement is going to go down through your replication hierarchy. So you can have, like, different table layouts with statement based replication as your alter is applying on all of these nodes, um, which is something you usually don't want your application to have to deal with. Um, you can see Jenny Snyder's talk um, from last year, uh, Let Robots Manage Your Schema Without Destroying All Humans. It's about how we use Percona online schema change real heavily at Yelp. Um, the lessons learned in this category for me are really just like, there's no one correct way to do schema changes. Like, you shouldn't pick one database product or one schema change, like, option, like, just because somebody tells you to. Like, you should really look at your environment and figure out what makes sense for you. Uh, next, we're going to talk about query plans. Um, spend a lot of time looking at these and try, trying to diagnose slow queries. Um, we're going to, this is smaller than I thought I was going to be. Um, this is, uh, we're going to kind of do a little bit of an example so that everybody can see what the same query in MySQL and Postgres looks like, uh, the, the query plan. So the idea here is, is that you have uh, a bunch of species, a bunch of animals, you have doctors, and then you have a reference table that tells, tells you which doctors can work on which animals. Uh, this is the query. It's a simple double join, and it just returns the name of the doctor and the species that they can uh, work on. So uh, this is a Postgres query plan. Uh, it is read from the bottom up in the inside out. Um, what it basically tells you is what kind of operations it's doing uh, for each, each part of the join, and it tells you which kind of join it's using. Um, if you need more data, Postgres can, you can do explain analyze. What explain analyze does is actually runs the query and then gives you back the exact query plan that it picked. From this, you get uh, extra things like memory usage, like how much memory each join or sort used and the exact time down to the microseconds that the query, that part of the query took, as well as the exact number of rows returned for each leaf in the query plan. If you want even more information, you can do explain, analyze buffers. This is great for when you are trying to figure out why does this query keep running faster. Uh, what this gives you is the exact number of uh, shared buffers that were hit while the query was run. run. So if you keep running this and this number keeps going up, Postgres is caching more and more of your data, and that's explaining why your query is running faster. So this, I feel, is the best way to get Postgres query plans so you can see exactly what's happening and get accurate timings of why your, how your query is running. This is a typical MySQL query plan. They're pretty wide, so I couldn't fit it on the whole slide. I'm sorry. Um, uh, this will tell you like what kind of select it's doing and uh, which kind of join that it's doing and the index that it tried to pick uh, like for this join. Uh, in MySQL, if you want more information as well, um, you can get the JSON query plan, which this goes way off the screen. This is more of a tongue-in-cheek slide. Uh, until recently, I had no idea how to read these uh, until Monday morning where I <laughs> spent some time at a... Um, tutorial and got like a good idea of what all of this means. Um, the lessons learned here is that query plans kind of like take a while to learn how to read and read well. Um, even just like up, up a couple years ago, like I was still learning about like, oh, these are what these numbers mean in the Postgres query plans and I've been reading them for my whole career. Uh, these two talks I have found be helpful to many people. Um, Baron's talk, Explain Demystified, and then from the Postgres side, uh, a friend of mine, Josh Burkus, gave a talk, uh, Explain Explained, and it like goes through the whole process of telling you what all the parts of the explain plans mean. Um, next, we're going to be talking about indexing strategies. This, I feel, we'll, we'll get into it, but there, this, I feel, is one of the more different parts between the two databases. 
Postgres has a lot of indexes that you can pick from, and this isn't even all of them. Uh, uh, you get like regular B tree indexes that I believe most people are used to. You can use GIST, which are generalized search tree indexes. This allows arbitrary indexing schemes. So if you want to like, uh, it's they're good for text. If you want to do full text search, or if you want to index JSON or like key value stores, this will allow you to like quickly retrieve that data. There's SPGIST which is the same as before, but it spatially locates the data on disk. This is almost exclusively used by PostGIS, the geospatial product for Postgres. GIN indexes are generalized inverted indexes. These are great, again, for composite values, um, where you're only gonna be searching for one part of the key. Um, these are also used in some cases on JSON blob stores. It's just kind of like a generalized index that you put on the JSON, and you can search pretty much the whole, all of the fields. Brin is new, and I love it, and I haven't had a reason to use it yet. It's a binary range index. It's good for, uh, or a block range index. It's good for handling large tables with append-only data and a primary key that you query on. What this index contains is the block ID number of any value you're looking for. So Postgres can quickly traverse this index, find which block to go to, and then pull the whole block data block off of disk, and then look for the values you're looking for. It's when it's used correctly, it's incredibly fast, and I've seen people use it with amazing results. Um, yeah, this I think is, <laughs> this is one of my favorite Postgres features that I miss terribly. Postgres has functional indexing. You can index on a where clause. You can index on a where clause. So what we're doing here is we have a, let's say we have a query where we're looking for orders in a system that haven't been completed yet, and so we want to know uh, where the orders uh, haven't been paid and where the payment ID is null. Let's say we run this query a lot on a table full of orders with millions of rows, and this is a small subset of the data. What this index will do is create a B tree just on those rows that where this rare clause returns true, and it'll index the restaurant ID and then the creation date. Um, when I showed this to my MySQL colleagues, uh, this was their reaction. Um, uh, it, it's not really intuitive, uh, but when used properly, it's, it can be amazing. Um, because of this, you will often find more indexes on a table than you will columns in Postgres databases. There's a, 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 a pattern where, like if you have a slow query, and like, like it's taking down your site, just quickly create a new index to support it and it'll like help you along. This is in general okay, because Postgres is really optimized for re rewriting data based on its MVCC model, and so it doesn't really become all that cumbersome. You do take a small insert hit where it would meet a condition of an index uh, and calculating which indexes Postgres has to update, but it makes your selects a lot quicker. Um, MySQL indexes, or I have a, a little bit less to say about them, but in general, uh, most people for MySQL are using uh, B tree indexes um, with InnoDB, so it provides clustered indexing. Um, this, uh, uh, and, and one tip that I have to keep reminding myself of is that long primary keys are bad, because they get added to the end of every single index because of clustered indexing, and I've seen some interesting behaviors because of this. Um, so I'm, this is kind of the end of the technical part, and I want to talk a little bit about the community and some other things. Um, Postgres really doesn't have the like equivalent package of MySQL utilities or Percona toolkit, um, or even just like searching GitHub for MySQL, like which which uh, and and finding the returns of tons of projects. Um, and because of this, like it becomes a little bit of a Google to be like, I want to be able to do this in Postgres, and you'll find somebody's project that they've done at some point to be able to support what you're looking for. Um, while there are a few big Postgres consulting companies, there's no one big company backing it. It is a really community-driven uh, project, and in general, the core team of Postgres meets twice a year and decides the roadmap together along with community input on what they're going to work on. Um, this one, Bob, there's no bug tracker for Postgres. There's an email list. Um, 
and it can be real daunting to try to find, I'm having this bug, has anybody else had this problem? It, it's, it can be a nightmare. Um, some things I missed from Postgres when working on my SQL. Um, flexible indexing, like I said, probably my favorite Postgres feature. Um, transactional DBL, DDL can be really nice, and just schema changes like in general. Um, it's, it, it was a real nice thing to have when that was a part of my career. Um, uh, in database, online schema changes, again with uh, transactional DDL, and I like wall style replication. It makes things really simple if you're doing, like so the slaves are in general very hard to try really hard to lag them from their master. Um, things I miss from Postgres when working on MySQL, sub-millisecond primary key selects on large tables. Holy crap. Um, when I look at our metrics uh, and comparing the MySQL databases and the Postgres databases we have, a lot of our MySQL data is like, I returned one row in you know, 86 nanoseconds, and I'm like, That's, I don't get that in Postgres. It's impossible. <laughs> How is this happening? Um, the community support, as I mentioned, is like incredible in MySQL. Like just this conference alone, I think is five times as big as the biggest Postgres conference that I've ever gone to. And counter to what I said before, I love the replication flexibility. It can be really neat to, you know, be able to do some creative replication stuff. That's the end. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh huh. Can you talk a little bit about what the use cases for having some of the different levels? Yeah, so we have our um, master database, obviously, and then all of our data centers uh, have an intermediate master database. Um, so, what this allows us to do is, you know, if they're on opposite sides of the country, save a lot of bandwidth from the between them. So, we can replicate to an intermediate master, and then the local replicas can then replicate from it. And then off of that, to make it even deeper, we have some specialized databases that replicate from our slaves. Yep. Yeah, so the, the question was, was, is there a way to introspect the hot standby feedback data? And the answer is yes. There is uh, PG stat replication, which is a table that you can query, and it'll tell you uh, all of the statistics of its replicas, where it's at, like in the wall stream, all of these things. Um, so the question was, uh, you can have multiple schemas inside a given database in Postgres. Usually you put all of your data in the public schema. Uh, that, so you can make other ones though, and a good example of one that's in every database is the PG stat schema, where most of the statistics are stored um, for that database. Um, I, I never really got heavily into using different schemas for different sets of data uh, when I was working in Postgres. Um, and, and when I did, it was only one or two extra schemas, and we solved this to make it easy by adding it to the global search path in Postgres so that any query could see all of the schemas. And um, in MySQL, because, because I really haven't done much schema management uh, inside Postgres, like it's just been easy because it's just like the one, yeah. Uh, in general, like unless you have a real strong reason to be using multiple schemas, and I can afterwards can give you some of those strong reasons, uh, it's usually best to to stick to just the public schema. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no problem. Um, the question was, uh, given my like short list of uh, non-online schema changes in Postgres, how do you get around those? Um, Booking.com actually has a really great blog post on this, on how they got around all of them. Um, uh, usually the answer is uh, like create new table, um, like alter the new table, backfill data, and then swap them is, is generally one of the only ways to do it. Yeah, there's a um, Postgres utility called uh, PG Repack, which basically does what PT Online Schema Change does, but its whole design is to remove dead tuples from the rows. Um, 
You can hack that to do schema changes. Uh, I've done this before, I would not recommend it, but if you search uh, PG Repack and schema changes, you'll find a few blog posts on how people have used it to be kind of like PT Online schema change. Yes? Uh, the question was, can I describe uh, patching and upgrading a, a highly uh, deep tree of, uh, in a MySQL environment? So what we do is we start kind of at like the very, like leaf nodes at the very bottom. We'll just work our way up, like adding a new server in, uh, like bootstrapping it from our environment, and then like adding it to our uh, load balancer. And then we'll remove the old, uh, you know, old version of uh, MySQL. Um, and we just kind of do that all the way up the stack until we get to the master, and then we have a, a, a pretty good process of how we do a master failover, which is basically the same thing of swapping it into place with a small amount of read-only time on our website. Uh, online remastering is about 15 minutes, maybe less. Yes. Can you say that again? Sorry. Uh, yeah, the question was, is there a multi-level -rep replication in Postgres? The answer is yes, there wasn't until about three years ago. You could only have a master and then a ton of replicas. Um, you can now have nested replication in Postgres. Yeah, so uh, there's actually shipped with Postgres a utility called uh, PG Promote, and you run that, and it takes care of everything that needs to happen to bring up that database as a master database. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, I don't have many yet because we uh, we're on MySQL 5.6 currently, so I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, uh, I have a, a pretty good amount of experience with Postgres's JSON support, so it'll be neat to play with that when I get there, but I haven't had the time yet. What about the concept of storage in the uh, Yep. So the question is about storage engines in Postgres. Uh, there are none. <laughs> there is, no. Uh, uh, Postgres, the, like, there's no client server model that, like, interacts that you can, like, swap out engines in. There is just Postgres, it is, there's, it has its own storage engine that it runs and you can't really do anything to get away from it. Yeah. Um, I can, t I have a whole talk that I can do about this, but if you want to come talk to me afterwards, I can like give you a few, few ideas. Yeah. Um, the question was, what's my take on moving into a, like a, a SaaS version of these databases? Um, I have limited experience with using uh, like Aurora or RDS. Um, from what I've seen of Aurora Postgres, I like it a lot. It's, they're doing a really neat things with it. Um, at the, the speed the companies I have worked for kind of demand out of their databases um, would not be able to be handled by like any cloud provider for us, so we still run, like if we run in the cloud, but like bare metal, we're managing our own instances. So I, I don't have enough experience to comment one way or the other. Yep. Um, question was when a developer comes and asks me, what should I pick, Postgres or MySQL? Um, Depends on the context. If it's at work, uh, it's, well, we have MySQL. Uh, here you go. Um, yeah, the, it, so it really depends on what you want. If you want to do, if the developer wants to do some clever indexing strategies or wants to do a full text search engine inside the database, or they want to do geospatial data, I'm like, well, look at Postgres. It has all of these features. If they're just storing data and like like columns in the database, my, like I said, MySQL is infinitely faster for simple data solutions than Postgres is. Yep. Yes. Um, what's the do with auto vectoring these days? Is that still a thing? I mean, I know it's become a slab 
Yeah, so something that I skipped entirely in this talk is Postgres's MVCC implementation. Um, one of the things that, uh, because of that, uh, you have to vacuum out dead rows out of the database and out of the index. Um, it can be a, a big overhead on the master database where this has to run, and the question was, what's the deal with auto vacuum these days? Um, still going, it's still getting faster. Um, parallel auto vacuum is coming in the September release of Postgres this year. Um, and they're adding more monitoring around it so you can actually see what vacuum is doing instead of that it's just running. Now you actually know what it's doing. So uh, the question was about Postgres's uh, internal statistics. Uh, they're all exposed for the most part on a per index and per database level. And uh, do you, a lot of people roll them up or do they use a tool that rolls them up for them or you just add them to your monitoring uh, raw? Um, and the, again, like it depends on the environment. Um, uh, for most of my career, I've just gotten the per stable, table statistics, and then on the time when you analyze them or have a tool analyze them, you do the roll up there so you can get more like fine grain. It allows you to, um, like if you have one problem table, just introspect it always without looking at the whole database. And if you do want to look at the whole database, uh, a sum or an average will suffice and be in general pretty quick. Any more questions? All right, thank you so much. Uh, get on with Yelp and we are hiring.